Hold on to your butt. Come on, sucker. Let's get it on. Oh, you want to fight? You want to fight? I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. You don't know anybody named Iris? I don't know nobody named Iris. Can I have a piece of toast? I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Western demands. How could you do this to me? Blit, I want to know. Why did you do that? What you feel only matters to you. Step back for one minute and look at the big picture. And that's all. No, no, not for the real fire. The orphans bond a family that very few can understand. Help me. Help you. <laughs> I don't do drugs. Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I am your co-host Iris and pipe the bimbo in red, my older brother. Wesley. And today we're talking 1991's JFK. The director's cut. A three plus hour movie, yeah. Thanks for that, Wes. Yeah, one of the greatest comedies of all time. John Candy, Jack Lemmon, <laughs> Walter Matthau. Dennis Nedry. Even John Larroquette. When they were in the courtroom... I just couldn't wait for Nedry to be like, Dodson, there's Dodson. Was he in the courtroom? He was definitely in the courtroom. And I think maybe he was one of the dudes in the car simulation, the magic bullet simulation. Yeah, he was. You know, it's really hard to think of him and Michael Rooker as good guys. Of course, there was no Bill Broussard. But yeah, he was kind of a good guy and then kind of a bad guy, I guess, insofar as this movie can have those. So he didn't turn because he was like a bad dude. He turned because they twisted his mind or they made they led him to believe that Kevin Costner's pursuit was indeed anti-American. Well, or that he would be killed for his trouble, either him or Garrison. Yeah, either way, he just freaked out. I get the gist of the conspiracy. And I, I'm i pretty sure I understand Jim Garrison's arc. But I confess, a lot of those details were over my head. It's pretty dense. I had to rewatch it several times in preparation for this review, and I've seen it at least a dozen times all the way through. I think that Oliver Stone in this juggling act did require those moments, moments to clarify, moments to sum things up in opening statements. There's another scene where Broussard is having trouble, and he's, he just says flat out, I'm lost, boss, and, you know, we chime in, us too. And Garrison, he, what are we saying here? And Garrison says, we're saying that when... Oswald went to Russia, he wasn't really defecting. He was an agent of the CIA, and that's how he got back. That's what we're saying. And it sums up all these relationships in Russia that kind of loses the thread for a minute. And we can rely on on Stone to kind of bring us back around in a way that lays it out for the layperson. Yeah. I think I also got the gist on, on Oswald's story, that he was a foot soldier and probably a patsy, and that he was drinking a Coke when JFK got shot. Right. Just waiting for his signal for whatever his role happened to be, whatever they assigned to him. I guess maybe I take it back. I don't know that I totally tracked Oswald's story. Was he a good guy or a bad guy? Or is are those kinds of classifications just kind of not very useful in this context? Well, I think that they were all he was bad to an extent. Certainly there's little argument over whether or not he shot Tippett on the way to the movie theater, that poor cop. Although we did get some testimony later on that some people saw a totally different guy or some people saw saw multiple people in the shooting of Tippett. But that doesn't yeah, very seem American to be... animals in that in those multiple recreations. Right. Right. And that doesn't seem very highly debated. So I think that he was involved, certainly on some level. Um, it's certainly suspicious the way he's portrayed in the movie. But even if he wasn't the person to pull the trigger or the only person to pull the trigger, he was obviously involved so much so that he resisted arrest, all while yelling, I'm not resisting arrest, and probably <laughs> shot Tippett and got killed for his trouble. So dropping the good guy, bad guy classifications, he was a CIA agent and he was he was obeying orders. But probably he wasn't aware that he was going to be the fall guy. 
Right. Well, that allowance that he was in Russia on the CIA's behalf also ties Russia in some way to the assassination because there are several different fronts. There are several different theories as to who contributed to the assassination. It's hard for me to accept that Jim Garrison nailed all of them on the head, that it was the mafia and the CIA and the FBI and the federal government, if those entities can be separated, and also the homosexual underworld and the anti-Castro Cubans and, you know, all all of it together um, have all been floated as ideas behind the assassination. If they were all in collusion, like Broussard said, how is it possible that we can't keep a secret between 11 people, but all these agencies together combined can cover up this massive conspiracy with no leaks? It does seem pretty unlikely, especially without some kind of mastermind behind it all. Right. And that doesn't seem, they never seem to identify who that could be. Well, if it was someone, according to Mr. X, uh, the Donald Sutherland character, then it was this mysterious General Y, who in the upper echelons of power could have orchestrated such a thing where he would call the lower ranking officials and say, hey, we're going. I need you to formulate a plan. You know, someone standing shoulder to shoulder with Johnson, according to Garrison, who was waiting in the wings to become president and who may have allowed or greenlighted this operation to kill Kennedy. Back to Oswald. Can you tell me where... This role fits into Gary Oldman's body of work? Um, I think they needed to portray Oswald as being pretty slimy. We weren't meant to like him. You know, we can allow that maybe in uh, an Oliver Stone's portrayal, he wasn't the lone gunman, but he seemed kind of unlikable. He didn't seem like the most personable type, and he was very enigm enigmatic. So in Gary Oldman's body of work, this one falls in the category of the weird, unplaceable accent. Because Oswald is American, he may have a tinge of Russian, given how extensively he studied the language, but Oswald's delivery in this movie is confusing to me. I can't pin it down. I think it's an amalgamation of many accents because he was, what, quadlingual? Uh, yeah, more than that. Five languages. Quin Quinlingual? Yeah, as, as was David Ferry. And certainly Joe Pesci didn't have a weird accent except for his Joe Pesci accent. Yeah, Joe Pesci was very Joe Pesci, but in a toupee. And so, what was with those eyebrows? Yeah, but that was the, supposedly what Ferry was like. He looked really weird, and nobody missed that, right? He was a weird-looking guy. Was he hairless? The alopecia or whatever? Is that what that is? Yeah. Because he, he did have his wig off, and he was completely bald when they found him dead. But And his eyebrows were fake. Right, so I guess maybe he was overcompensating. <laughs> It helped that he was a weird guy. I think it helped him be identified. Yeah. I guess not a weird role for Joe Pesci because he's kind of the manic, sweary little guy, you know, in a lot of the roles. And maybe not that weird a role for Gary Oldman, who's all who seems kind of slimy and, and is just a little bit off in a lot of his roles, I think intentionally so. But this whole movie was populated with people playing against type. Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Well, especially Tommy Lee Jones, who was kind of an alpha male type, right? That was Shaw's whole deal, that he could go fishing after he gets acquitted, but also a real skeevy preying upon male prostitutes kind of underground homosexual. Yeah. Painted gold in, in uh, powdered wigs. That was so bizarre. Like, they were all a part of this conspiracy, but they just kind of indulged and had fun along the way? Well, I guess. So... One of the points of this movie that stands out is that everything that was theorized was represented on screen. Whether or not it was dismissed, we saw a version of it. True. The Oswalds popping up around town, the recreation of the Tippett murder on the way to the Texas theater. We saw all of those things, even if they weren't given credence later. It was a Rashomon type of filmmaking where it gives it weight when you see something visually, even if it's proven to be untrue. It's supposed to read like archival, but obviously it's recreation or it's fiction. Right. But like, I'm assuming that device worked for you where it didn't work for you in Defy Bloods. It's true. And in Defy Bloods, I cited the lack of realism as my problem. In JFK, I've considered this and I don't believe that it works realistically as a dramatic movie. But its presentation, I don't think, was ever meant to be immersive to where you forget you're watching a movie. It's an onslaught 
of different film stocks, different images. It's a combination of dramatic acting and archival, this weird faux archival sort of recreation, but there was definitely archival footage. Nobody can argue this a Pruder film. And then when Oswald gets shot and you see Gary Oldman go down, the quick shot of him being surrounded by the officers who had brought him out in the basement was real footage of the actual Oswald intercut with Gary Oldman. Oh, pretty seamlessly. I can see why this thing got an Oscar for editing. And that was the great Pietro Scalia. But the magic bullet scene in the courtroom at the end was actually a clip that I used in one of my film classes where we were asked to bring in, I believe it was a two minute clip of some movie and discuss it. And it was the magic bullet, which used the Zapruder film and then dramatic filmmaking and then the recreation that was meant to look like archival. And then also the sets and the models that were built of Dealey Plaza. In conjunction with that they the music use it in the courtroom. and the sort of hip hop editing and the diagrams and everything makes for a very compelling storytelling device that must be so complicated. There's so many things, right? <laughs> There's so many things. And I think the courtroom example is, is an apt one because it's so deceptively simple because it reads in my mind like a Kevin Costner monologue. Its execution is so complex between his monologue, between the courtroom footage, the recreation footage, the archival footage, the models, the diagrams. Like, it didn't read to me as being quite complex, but when you talk about it, I see that it really is, and I think it's a good example for the film overall. So maybe not an immersive film. Obviously, you're struggling to keep up and things, and in that way, it's engaging, but it's maybe like the best historical recreation ever in a way that compels you along. It's like a documentary, but acted out. But I just meant to suggest that this is elevated filmmaking that has to be handled deftly. A madman can't helm this film and still have it hold together the way it does. Even though Oliver Stone might be a little bit of a madman. Is he? Is he, he seems calculating and precise, if not maybe even cold. Yeah, well, this is his magnum opus. He's made lots of movies, and some of them that come close to JFK in terms of controversy, but he definitely also considers this one of his favorite, if not his favorite film that he did. So taking all the conspiracy theories from noted professionals, like the forensic, uh, the people who did the autopsies and things, as well as the whack jobs who were just standing on an overpass in Dealey Plaza, who say, no, man, I saw a thing from over here. To be able to weave all of these things seamlessly into what becomes deceptively simple dramatic filmmaking is kind of extraordinary. And to be able to treat each one with, I guess, equal weight. And who do we have that's doing these things still? Who's dedicating their lives to pursuing the people that they believe murdered JFK as part of a conspiracy? Uh, the magic bullet theory, in part was suggested to have been debunked because it was revealed that Jim Garrison's diagrams didn't account for the fact that President Kennedy's seat in the back seat of the uh, the Lincoln Town Car was elevated over Senator Conley's and, and his wife's, so that the downward trajectory of the bullet, as it was supposed to have come from the Texas Book Depository, could have caused all the wounds. But that doesn't account for the bullet that they held up as evidence as it being a single bullet, the untarnished, undamaged lead slug that supposedly fell out on the stretcher. That was fired from Oswald's rifle. Right. As evidenced by the three casings side by side in the firing nest on the sixth floor next to his rifle, which he also left there so he could escape and drink a Coke and not look sweaty. <laughs> but we saw all of that stuff, right? We saw the recreation of Oswald running past those two ladies who never acknowledge him because in reality he wasn't there running past mm -hmm. them. It was just so much credence given and so many things represented. It's hard to know. At one point, Garrison says the spectacle of everything that happened was intended to confuse the eye and confound the understanding. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And if I regarded JFK, Oliver Stone's masterpiece, as kind of a hustle, as trying to pull something over on us to make us believe things that aren't there, that we see shapes in the smoke, this would have been my argument for it is that he threw so much at us that it confounded and confused our understanding in such a way that we could open the door to things that we didn't previously believe were true, whether or not they're actually possible. So it's very meta. When Garrison mentions that, he's talking about the Warren report and the official research done around JFK's assassination. 
But you're saying that the movie does the same thing to open us up to the possibility of a conspiracy? Well, I haven't read the entire Warren report. I'm guessing it doesn't contain a lot of Garrison's more fantastical elements of the conspiracy. The entire Warren report? You've read some of the Warren report? Yes, I have. Uh, it's actually available pretty, for pretty cheaply. <laughs> I don't alert. deny that. But JFK can't tell us who the assassin was. In fact, JFK opens more questions than it answers, right? Well, it certainly does. And the case isn't shy about that at all. At all. You know, the, the juror sums it up for us pretty neatly in his press statement that the case makes you believe there was a conspiracy, whether or not Shaw was involved or the details are accurate, weren't proven. And we hear that specifically from a juror after Clay's exoneration. But do we know for sure that that's the truth? Is it a matter of public record that the juror said, we all believed it was a conspiracy, but whether or not Clay Shaw was a part of that conspiracy is a completely different kettle of fish. I'm totally quoting the movie like a nerd. I almost did the accent. You, you're, you're asking me if it's official that the jurors believed in Jim Garrison's conspiracy? Well, this movie instituted some level of change in that at least they were still investigating the Kennedy case, which the Warren Commission report supposedly had definitively closed. But I don't know exactly how much that's been conceded by the federal government. If it was, because I'm I'm guessing that if you open any school book in America now, it will say that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone shooter. And if it doesn't, it would have as a footnote or an asterisk also some theories abound. <laughs> but let's approach this from Oliver Stone's JFK perspective. It calls into question what is widely, I would argue to say, regarded as fact that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. And what Garrison and Stone do on a number of levels is try to disprove that by saying it's not possible that this could have happened. We already touched on the magic bullet, which suggests that there has to have been more than three shots supposedly fired by Oswald because all the stuff that happened, all the wounds in Kennedy and Connolly and James Tagg under the underpass couldn't have happened with only three bullets. But aside from that, Lou, Garrison's associate, says from the firing test that what Oswald attempted couldn't have been done, that nobody could have recreated it, and because of the bolt action required to chamber another round, he couldn't have gotten off three shots in 5.6 seconds, I think it was. It's, well, especially with accuracy. Right. Additionally, Mr. X's testimony or revelation to Garrison in Washington about all the logistics of Dallas and how they were ignored, how everybody was asked to stand down, how he was sent to the North Pole, how the cabinet was on their way to blah, 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 how you would have felt a military presence, but all of the basic protection codes were violated. They never would have allowed open windows. They never would have allowed Umbrella Man to open his umbrella or for the caravan to slow down and make that turn or have the bubble top removed. If that's true, there would have been something wrong. If that was a blatant violation, that stands as something that needs to be addressed. If it's true that the international newspapers he was reading had full accounts of Oswald and clearly established his guilt before he was four hours before he was charged with the official crime, if that stuff is true, something is wrong. And if it's not true, and if it's just Oswald and we've got it wrong, then Oliver Stone made up a whole lot of stuff. Or he gave credence to wackos who said a bunch of whole, a whole lot of stuff and then put it in his movie. A lot of this does depend on X, on Donald Sutherland's character, who I, was, who I assume has still not been identified. He has, actually. So the X claims are pretty far and wide. And if anything, more than anything, implicates the federal government, specifically the CIA, who would know all about these black ops. And yes, the X character, because he was unnamed, drew the most criticism initially and has been since revealed to supposedly have been based on a colonel named Fletcher Prouty, who was also a technical advisor on the film. And Prouty made an official statement or testified? I don't or know. It seems like a lot rests on him, and he seems, at least in the movie's portrayal, pretty credible. And he asks the important question. He asks the question that the whole movie begs. Why? Why? Who killed JFK? Who benefited from it? And who had the power to cover it up? 
which, and the cover-up in particular, is why Garrison argues that the mob couldn't have done it, why any outside force couldn't have done it. Because if any number, if any one of this number of allegations made by people about lapses in protection and oversights and acknowledgments that there were threats in a hostile city like Dallas that were patently ignored, if uh, Prouty or the X character was credible, or if any of that stuff was true, we have to concede that more may be true. It opens a can of worms. And then the DA decides whether or not to pursue it. The DA of New Orleans, of all places. And granted, that's where Bannister was set up. That's where Oswald was handing out anti-communist leaflets. But he was the one who pushed forward. And in spite of him saying that if it takes him 30 years to identify all the killers and bring them to justice, then he will pursue this case for 30 years. That comes from a direct quote to a Playboy interview that he did in 67, and he went to his grave, never really getting farther along than publishing on the trail of the assassins. It's like OJ saying he's going to find a Cole's killer, and people are like, are you going to find him on the golf course? <laughs> Well, if Jim Garrison in real life was anything like the Jim Garrison portrayed by Kevin Costner, he seems pretty tenacious. He might have made some headway Appeared in, in the, the movie last too. 20 years. Yeah, he was the judge, right? Yep. Um, speaking of Jim Garrison, do you think that this movie does its job because you're talking about the JFK assassination conspiracy? I mean, doesn't this movie also succeed on a human storytelling level? Jim Garrison's story, his family life, his career are really the spine to which all the meat of the details stick. Yes, and I would argue that it wasn't particularly good in that respect. I don't really believe Kevin Costner as Jim Garrison, with the exception of the courtroom scene, where you can obviously tell that Costner believes. He gets pretty emotional. But I don't think he is very good in his role. I think his accent is wonky. He's never been the strongest of actors, although I like watching him. I think Sissy Spacek as his wife was pretty much the same naggy, disbelieving wife. You know, you're missing your kid's childhood, Jim, and we waited for hours, and what are you doing, and you're attacking him, you know? She's the Anne Hathaway. Right. She's the Anne Hathaway to Garrison's Rob Ballot. Exactly. At the same time, when Robert Kennedy is assassinated and he's all sad and says, well, he won and they killed him. And she's like, no, both brothers, because you've got to make sure we know what they're talking about. And then they do the sex is a little bit weird. I I understand what you're saying. And it it is his home life is important and how him setting off on this journey doesn't just try to affect change in the country, but it also radicalizes his entire life, his way of thinking and and presumably puts his family in real danger. I'm not sure if they ever got a call about the height and weight of the daughter in the fake beauty contest because someone was out to get the garrisons. Obviously, no one has been out to get the garrisons since, or Oliver Stone, or anybody else. In fact... To your knowledge. Do you remember the movie Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson? No. Julia Roberts, too. And so he's a wacko, and I think she's investigating him. So Mel Gibson's character in that movie, among his many conspiracy theories across all topics on his wall, is the Oliver Stone-George Bush connection. And the lady asks him, what's that about? And he says, well, think about it. Oliver Stone, JFK, if any of that were true, and he believes that it is certainly, why would the federal government ever allow that movie to be made? Freedom of speech? If there's any, well, yes, of course. But if there's anything incendiary, because it seems like, according to Garrison, the federal government had no problem eliminating anyone who would incriminate them on any level. And it's possible. It does get a little bit confusing because everyone from random guy in the bathroom to the cops seem to be harassing Jim Garrison when Broussard suggests that there was going to be assassination attempt on him somewhere between him and New Orleans. That was a great moment because he was like, thank you for coming back, but you're violating the number one, number one rule of the team, which is don't perpetuate rumors. Right. But why was he looking all shady when he was at the newsstand? Or was that just Jim Garrison's interpretation of that look? Yeah. So Broussard was, he said that he got word that there was going to be assassination attempt on Garrison. Got word from who? And was that meant to inject paranoia into the team? I mean, I don't, we never saw <sighs> Broussard after that. He sent him well, back to New he, Orleans on his dime, but he never rejoined the team. Well, the, the dude who muscles him into the car, that was FBI, right? 
Yes. I'm pretty sure he was FBI. Okay. Which means that he was probably in with the FBI and the FBI may, ha- may have fed him intelligence, whether true or, or just with the intention of inciting fear. But Jim Garrison certainly seems, his stubbornness seems to extend into his personal life where he refuses to be afraid to, to walk around afraid, which seemed a little bit naive to me after David Ferry and all these other people are, are offed. I had to attribute it to X saying, you don't have a choice. You move forward or they're going to take you out. You have to be able to stir the shit storm enough, build up a case and create a, a level of critical mass that where people are going to come forward on their own. Otherwise, you're dead. And then he said... He's protected as long as he's in the light. Right. And then he said, and good luck with that and disappeared. <laughs> I don't think that there was one thread that Oliver Stone was like, I will just let that go. That's kind of tenuous. So he's grasping all the straws and he's holding them as t- onto each of them as tightly as possible. Right. He's got all these threads and he's in the center and he's like, just braid them together. I don't know. Uh, the Jack <laughs> Lemmon character, sir, he, he's kind of forgettable and his name was Jack in the movie, but he set up Shaw and Shaw's affiliation with Oswald and Shaw's affiliation with Ferry and tied them all to Operation Mongoose. All the anti-Castro Cubans that are being trained in the secret facility that, that supposedly exists and all of that stuff. There's no one in my giant diagram page of everybody involved that's not connected in some way to someone else. It's very thorough. It just is a little bit unwieldy for a first viewing. Or a podcast episode. So it comes down to how effective was this movie. This is one of my favorite movies. Even if it's confusing to the eye and confounding to the understanding, it's still entertaining in a way that I think the best movies are. They take something that you don't ordinarily believe, they suspend your disbelief, and then they convince you over the course that something that is not actually happening is happening and is possible. I'm not saying that the conspiracies don't hold weight. I'm saying convincing me of all these things in an effective way is a testament to this movie's efficacy and thrust and an ability to make me concede that a world may exist that doesn't actually exist. And in addition to all that, it also answers its own question of why is this important to us? Right. And I think that that is the function of Garrison's family. Garrison's sissy SpaceX says, I want our life back. I want my life back. I want our family. And he says that he's lost something too, that he wants his life back too. He wants the version of America that he held in his mind and his heart back. And that's what the fight is for. And he needs her at least to the extent that she supports him to do the same, to, to look in the face of what this really is. So the I, I think his personal life comes through rather nicely as a through line. You see the arc of, of his relationship with his wife, and they literally leave the courtroom together. So he has, he put his family life on the line in pursuing this, and he wins that back. So, I mean, in addition to just making it a human story, the family has a very important function reminding us why the story is important. Yeah, an emotional propellant. It's important because we're propelled along by the family of Jim Garrison and Jack Kennedy, his brother, his wife, his kids, right. and everyone involved. Right. But JFK works in a way that the report, the torture report, doesn't because of Jim Garrison's family and, you know, Daniel Jones kind of distinct lack of family and (laughs) life experience. It expanded my concept of filmmaking in a way that defined my love of movies. Movies are supposed to feel bigger than images on celluloid. They're supposed to engage you emotionally and open your eyes to new places, new things, different people that you would never have access to in a way that's believable. It felt like history opera. That shouldn't be the quote. That sounds dumb. <laughs> it's almost as if the movie succeeds in in giving you the impression that you have a grasp on this story, even if you don't have answers. I felt overwhelmed by how much I didn't know. And in, in doing so, you strive to understand what you can. And then you look up to and admire people who have obviously a firmer grasp on any given situation that you do. This movie is awfully patriotic. 
Right. Idealistically patriotic, because, yes, I think that the ideals of America are great in practice. It seems like in our 244 year history, that hasn't really been the America. It's never been the America it's proposed itself to be. Um, but we try. Well, he literally says it at one point, right, where he's like, if this is something, the country, blah, 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 then it's not the country I want to be in or whatever. Right. <laughs> Talk about misquotes. If we cannot question our own government, then this is not the country that I want to live in and certainly not the country that I want to die in. Nerd alert. Did you cover all of the dorky stuff you wanted to talk about? More or less. The one good thing about this movie, if nothing else, is this movie is one of the cornerstones of Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Because you got everybody <laughs> in this one. As a matter of fact, I discovered everybody I discovered in that movie. in some versions of the Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon, this movie is inadmissible. It's just cheating. Everybody is in this movie. Like every time somebody popped up, I was like, oh, 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 yeah, they're in here. Okay. But I'm definitely a dork when it comes to this movie. I like watching it and I like watching and seeing new things. And there's so much space to be able to do that because it is so very long. But like the best yeah. long movies, it doesn't feel long. This is certainly not yeah. the only three hour Kevin Costner movie. But for me, it's the best and the easiest. Oh, yeah. There's Dances with Wolves. Waterworld was pretty darn long. The Postman was pretty Oof. darn long. You know how you were saying you were talking about Michael Rooker speaking for the audience and being like, I have to admit, boss, I'm lost. Yep. Um, Kevin Bacon speaks for like all the women when he's like, you ain't a bad looking man, Mr. Garrison. Yeah, you think so? I'm like, oh, yeah. Kevin Ho Kevin Costner is yummy in this role. Kevin, ew, Kevin Hotner. You know, he was aged up for this role, put in dumb glasses and hats and given a little bit of gray hair. Yeah, his little gray sideburns were really kind of badly done. How are you enjoying co-hosting or whatever movies? Uh, it's fun. It makes me feel close to my sister. And it, it's always been fun. And because before we were doing the podcast, watching movies over and over again and then researching them was what I was doing anyway. I just didn't have anyone who would encourage my nerding out about them. Not only now do you have an outlet, but you also have a platform to nerd out about the nerdiest nerd movies out there. Yep. Which aren't really nerd movies. I just, they're the ones that I latch onto. JFK is getting top 10 movies of all time for me personally. So there you got it. A totally from Wes, a good from Iris. That is our review on Oliver Stone's JFK. Let us know what you think or whatever movies at gmail.com, 818-835-0473 on social media at or whatever movies and our website. Do people do those anymore? Or whatever movies.com. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time.